Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Let's all stand up to the Lord this morning. Any requests as we uh, go to the Lord? He's not feeling good, yes. And also Brother John Crothers as well. And there may be other requests, spoken, unspoken, yes. For Deborah? For Deborah, yes. All right, let's all lift up our voice together. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee, we thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayer, Lord, that you know all the things, Lord, that we've asked for this morning, even before we asked it. But, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that we can have that privilege that we can approach thee in prayer. And Lord, we pray that you meet these needs this morning. Lord, that you be in this service, Lord, and you would have your way in every part of it, Lord. And as well, Lord, we think about thy nation, Israel. Bless them as well. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. We're going to have Brother Paul lead us in the song service. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone this morning. I'm just thinking of that song, those words. He was there all the time, waiting patiently in line for us to make time for him. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you, Lord. One of these days you're going to look for me and I'll be gone. people left when Jesus came. One of these days you're going to be not to go. One of these days you're going to look for me and I'll be gone. I'm going to have my wings and I'll head home. There'll be a lot of people left when days Anybody have a number? Which one? 45 in the red book.
<clears throat> 46 in the same book. The next page over. <clears throat> Start with the chorus, okay. Thank you. 
wonder if we could do a 450 in the blue book here. Four fifty. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create. Joy of God. 
Come on to me, all who are weak, for I am strong. Come on to me when the trials of life keep pulling you wrong.
There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none. thinking Elijah might have a song or
an opportunity presented itself. We went on a little road trip to Quebec to meet uh, my sister Julie and her boyfriend. We <coughs> spent a few days there and it really did us some good to just spend some time with them. And when we got back, we got back on Wednesday. And uh, we knew we were getting more results on Thursday. So on Thursday morning, we got a phone call from the clinic. And uh, we sat together and put it on speakerphone and they let us know that the results were 99% that the baby had Down syndrome. So that day was really difficult. We just were broken and we cried all day. And then that night, my parents came over and we prayed. And uh, the next morning, it felt like a huge burden had to lift it off my shoulders. And, and really, I thought this was going to break not all because I had never seen him this way before. And since then, we've gotten such an outpouring of love and support and comments and messages and prayers. And uh, last night, we were actually sitting on the couch and watching videos of children with Down syndrome and looking at pictures of families with kids with Down syndrome. And um, one of the videos that we watched was really cute and it was a young boy and his brother. And his brother had Down syndrome and it was just so touching and that I actually said, I look forward to it. And I never ever thought, especially in such a short time frame, that his heart would change that way. So I just want to thank you all for your prayers and let you know that we're in a good place and our spirits are good. And just keep praying for us. I wasn't going to testify this morning, but after hearing my sister's testimony, I was thinking about Jesus Christ, how he died on the cross of Calvary. He suffered like no man ever suffered. I know what it's like to feel pain. Having broken ribs, I know what it's like. A toothache. I know what it's like. <coughs> Some of you have lost a child. I don't know what it's like. But I'm glad this morning that Jesus Christ do we realize how much he suffered on that cross? He was in agony. He paid the price for our sins. And he even prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me.
As a father, we try to, we do everything that we can to try to help our children. We try to protect them. But our Heavenly Father, He knew that Jesus Christ had to pay a debt he did not owe. And we owed a debt that we could never pay. And you don't think that our Heavenly Father, well, his son was on the cross, how much he suffered, and he was tortured. You don't think that didn't have an effect on our Heavenly Father? I know what my sister is, has just expressed, that she is going through a very, very difficult time. But I believe that God's grace is sufficient. God will give them the strength that they need I am so thankful this morning that we can turn to him in the time of need and time of trouble, and he will always be there. He may, we may not get everything we ask for, but God knows what is best for each and every one of us this morning. And I'm so thankful that we can rest and we can have that peace and that joy knowing that God does everything well. Thank you. Even though we may not understand, Thank you. one day we will understand it all by and by. We will understand why the trials and the tests and everything that we go through. It's for our growth. It is. It's for our good. Brother Paul, I wonder if I could sing a song this morning. Yes. Okay. If it's if it's too late, that's okay. No, we'll sing it time. Praise God. <clears throat> I know people today that look so down and out. I know because I've been that way before. But I found peace and happiness I can enjoy. Oh, it's a good life living for the Lord.
brother Elijah. I know you have a song. <laughs> Turn 
not my testimony, but uh, that my sister Kelly, um, the other couple of days ago, she was home and she had a lot of pain in her body because she had a lot of problems. And uh, she come to the end like she just had a hard time with it. So anyways, uh, maybe a couple of days later, she was at work and uh, she was just doing the work and a man came up to her and he says, uh, I think I know you. And she looked at him and she says, sir, I don't know you. And um, she said what her name was. She told him uh, her main name, where she worked in the past for 17 years. And he says, no. He said, but the Holy Ghost sent me here to pray for you. Thank you. And uh, he told her exactly what was wrong with her. She had osteoporosis, her spine, everything that was wrong with her. And uh, she said, Christ, they were in the middle of her store. And uh, he prayed for her. And she felt warm going down her spine. And Christ was a pain one. She said she felt great after that. And uh, she thanked the man and she turned around. He was gone. Praise the Lord. God is good. Wherever we are, she's not far. She's serving the Lord. Praise 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 the Lord. Amen. Cheer up, dear. One of these days you're going to come in and bring us home. Yeah. We'll have a resurrected body. Yeah. No more aches, no pains, no. All your hair will come back. We just those that lost some and things and so forth, but praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee this morning, Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that we can come before thy throne of grace, Lord, as we would look into your word this morning. I just pray, Lord, use this vessel of grace you would see fit. We're asking it now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I was to pick a title this morning, God Sends Warning Before Judgment. And uh, I'm thankful that he does, but sometimes God has no choice but to bring judgment on the land because of the evilness of the, the way people are living and so forth. But we're living in a special hour right now. We are now in 2017, almost 2018. And in the hour that we live in, we have, God has given the bride a great knowledge of the time that she's living in. And it's only by the Holy Ghost that you know the truth of the time you're living in. I went on the internet and uh, you can go to YouTube or different places 
and there's all kinds of sermons. You can pick the variety you like. And I can see that there's so much variety of things that express that confusions abounds abundantly. And so therefore, had not the Holy Ghost picked us up, that's enough to discourage anyone. Because after a while, you say, oh, this is interesting here, this is interesting over there. And then all of a sudden, well, who, who knows the truth? So you're, you're in confusion. But the Holy Ghost that he's given you and I, he has that little warning bell inside that tells you, this is, he, this is truth and this is error. Yeah. Granted, when we're young, walking in the Lord, when we first come to the Lord, we don't know much. And he, if you get turned around by something that's wherever you're at, God's obligated because if you're his child, he's going to take and correct you and I to bring us to a place where we know what his word is. He's obligated because God will only confirm his word and not every mouthpiece that's on the planet. And, I'm, and if we're patient, us Gentile has that bad habit. I want to know everything yesterday. Yes, we do. Even in shopping. Can you send it yesterday? How long? Is it going to take a month? Well, that's too long. So we are an in, impatient people, but the Gentiles are. But I want to talk this morning about what we call in this hour a five-fold ministry. Yes, when Jesus walked on earth, he spoke wonderful words, and like he said, my words, they're not mine, they're my heavenly Father's. And the one that should have received his words rejected and rebelled. And if you look at some things that are being taught on some just formal denomination, well, Jesus spoke back then, and sometimes you have no clue if he's ever going to speak again. No, he won't speak as someone walking physically on the earth. But he definitely spoke from heaven. Because the Apostle Paul speaks about, forsake not him that speaketh from heaven. And so, yes, the Lord started to spring. There would be a time in 1963, God had to bring a major ministry. Not just any preacher. that God would endued him with signs and wonders. And it's not the signs and wonders that confirms God's word. But it's to get a hold of a people. That God was going to speak something that mankind should take note of, especially the religious world. He spoke through a prophet. Now, you say the word prophet and everybody, if you, I was speaking to a denominational church, they'd be all nervous right now. Because if you're speaking about a prophet, it has to be within their organization. Well, Jesus was the prophet of all prophets. He didn't come from the Jewish organization. And so therefore, yes, God did something in this hour that really shook the religious world, those that were seeking God. There's a lot of people that go to church today on Sunday but it's just a formality it's just to give them peace well if I go to church I won't go to hell and that's all they want to know I'll tolerate an hour of going to a church somewhere now that was back in my days when I was young but today twice a year is sufficient Christmas time, Easter. Besides that, they don't want God involved in their life. 
So God sending a prophet would not benefit that kind of an individual that don't even care about God. He's just using God as an excuse to go somewhere to make somewhat of peace. But yet, it is his choice. You have the right to choose what you want to do, but, the word, but you're not free from the consequences of your choice. And how thankful. Yes, I wasn't there in the days that God had a prophet on the scene. But there's enough testimony of the things that God used him for that there was no other ministry like that one. Yet the religious leaders of all the different denominations did the same thing to him as they did to Jesus. Now it's not the prophet that, that, that we have to look at. The words that he received was of the Heavenly Father, the same one that Jesus spoke. So the one that's speaking from heaven starts speaking again. And it shook the religious world. By the time he came on the scene in those revelation of those six seals that's in that book of Revelation, and that book of Revelation, I say 99% of the denomination don't want to touch it. Yes, the evangelical try from time to time to use their scripture here and the scripture there, but only to get tripped up because they don't have a true revelation in the picture. But this is the hour. God has a people that knows what he's saying, what he said, and what he's doing in 2017. I'm thankful for that. There were parables that Jesus spoke when he walked here on earth. The parable in Matthew 25 picks you up from concerning the servants from the early church that would run through the course of the grace age. But when he spoke and the thing that's recorded in Luke does not start back there. It starts in this generation. Because it talks about in Luke chapter 12. And he that he shall come down and feed servants down here. At the end time. For what purpose? To prepare a people. Now how did God speak from heaven or feed meat down here? He didn't feed them. The gospels that he preached when he, the, the doctrines that he preached when he was here on earth. He didn't bring in things concerning the doctrines of the apostles. But he started speaking things in the book that was not revealed. They were written, but they was not opened up. They couldn't be opened up till the time would arrive that they would be meaningful to a true Holy Ghost born again believer could see the truth. The religious worlds don't see it. They may have an intellectual understanding to a point, but that's all they know. So in Luke, that 12th chapter, very small words. It didn't mean much to the apostles in the early church, but Luke recorded it, the words of Jesus. Because here at the end time, that would come full front center of what's been going on. When he said he came to feed servants down here, he's not feeding the servants in heaven because it's too late then. The food's already been served. So as he comes down, and that what started with the ministry of that prophet and an apostolic ministry that he was preparing a ministry that would finish this bride of Jesus Christ and he would come to rapture her. But as that now comes into place, we have gone into the third watch because when Jesus spoke that parable in Luke chapter 12, he's, after he's talking about feeding servants, then he gives an indication what to look for. He says, what about if I come in a second watch? Or what about if I come in a third watch? Well, someone can say, well, Jesus, why do you try to confuse people second, third? You just come in one time. 
Now he was going to bring information that would bring up people up to date, and they would be through three periods of time. First, it had to start so the world would know that it had begun. He used a prophet. He used an apostle. And the things were brought still stands today. It's so clear. Now, there's many in there. If you go on the internet, they claim to be apostles. But if you look back at the things they said a few years back, they, they mix up Timmy Turvey. It's, it's changed. It never, it's never steady and never the same. But God's true, true apostle will be. So when God took him off the scene, he had used, yes, he has to use men, because Jesus doesn't come physically to serve people on the earth. That's why he ordained man to preach the word, not angels. And so therefore, having a ministry that would, would now feed a final stage of a five-fold ministry. Why five-fold? It's Ephesians chapter 4. It's in the Bible. It's been there ever since Paul wrote it, that there would be five type of ministries that would be needed for the bride to come to her completion and to be completed. I know most of you have heard this before. But now, as we entered the era of time, or the period of time, once we move from 2004, 2005, God takes that, upon, that teacher that he used to instruct the fivefold ministry, the ministry for the hour, off the scene. God now wants that ministry, yes, to be educated, settled, tested, and proved. Now, not everyone that was hearing is going to be tried, tested, and proved. Because there's going to be false ones as well as true ones that goes on. But if you have the Holy Ghost, you'll see the Word, how the Spirit of God opens the pictures and sees it. And we are now living in that fivefold ministry. But what is that fivefold ministry? Its final result is in Isaiah 52 and 8. They are watchmen. And I asked a question this morning. What is a watchman for? Just a nice title that he can have? We're going to see into Ezekiel chapter 33. What is the office work, what is God is requiring of a watchman. And a watchman is not, now, as using the type, he would be a man that there would be a city and walls, and he's watching on the walls for two things, the enemy and his Lord that would be coming. He'd be on the lookout of things that was coming t future towards him. A watchman is not a watchman that looks in the city and says, well, oh, there's, things are happening inside the city. That's not a watchman. That's a gospel man. So don't tell me a watchman is just going to be looking internally and because he's looking internally in the gospels of Jesus Christ, sorry, the doctrines of Jesus Christ, the doctrines of the apostle and and then the teachings of Jesus Christ is not a watchman. He's going to have to know where his Lord is at and be on the lookout for his coming. And on the lookout for his coming, not all was revealed during that apostolic ministry that, he, that they were fed by. Because otherwise, if it was... This bride should be completed now. Because if there's no more revelation to be had, the rapture should be on. But you and I, they are still here too. But I'm thankful that God has men that will be watchful. They're watching forward, not backwards. But Satan knows this. And what he, does he do? He raises, he allows them to be raised up to be watchmen that 
looks at false things. At the same time, that's to try the people. What are, what are you hearing? What do you, have you heard? And how do you know that it is the truth? And the only way you're going to know that is that Holy Spirit that lives within you. He's the one that confirms what's right and what's wrong. Now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 33. Now remember, in Ezekiel when this was taking place, this was 600 years before Jesus ever come. But the principle that you see in there applies very much to any man that's called to be a watchman. And so therefore the the Lord is speaking to to Ezekiel says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, speak to to thy children of thy people and say unto them. Now, yes, In the days of Ezekiel, it was a nation of Israel that God would get them to speak to. But watchmen in this hour is not speaking to the nation of Israel. It's speaking to the religious Christianity world. So, as a type, God is telling him, Son of man, speak to thy people. We're not going to go back 600 years and try and do this. But we're living in an hour, there's supposed to be watchmen also. Just like Ezekiel was called to be a, a watchman. He didn't graduate to be a watchman. It was in his makeup to be a watchman. He didn't have to work it out. God used him because he knew it was, the ability was in him for it. All right. Then he says, when I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man from the coast and set him for their watchman. So God's talking about a watchman being set up. Then he goes on to say, then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning. And if the sword comes. That takes him away, his blood will be upon his head. In today's, the watchman is to sound a trumpet of an oncoming enemy that be coming. Or a truth that's supposed to be coming that the bride is to receive. And if the people refuse and don't take heed, they are responsible for their own life. And if they take not warning, and if the sword comes. Now what is the sword that's coming in the hour? God is bringing judgment down the road here. There's going to be a judgment at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ for the bride. That's before that terrible week of Daniel ever starts. But for the sinners of the world, it'll be his physical second coming. Because God has brought a word on ground, warning, I'm coming. But if mankind don't even want to go to church like those that only go once a year, it's on their head. Now if the watchman does not give a warning... That God holds a watchman responsible for their blood. But if the watchman speaks of things, then they are responsible for their own blood and the watchman is not held guilty for, the, for their blood of them losing their lives. In the sense of, well, the end result is concerning eternal life we're talking about. He that hears the sound of a trumpet and takes not warning, his blood shall be upon him. 
you can't blame the watchman. If the watchman is true to his calling, he's not going to bend to feelings, personality, or anything else. Because God's saying, this is serious. Warn the people. Wake up. Because you can find something similar in one aspect in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, not the past, today, and whatever that day you want to look at, harden not your hearts, as in the day of provocation. Now he's pointing to what it, they did, the Jews, as they came out of Egypt and went into the, the desert and they provoked the Lord. They came, but they didn't believe. They murmured. They did, did everything but the right thing. They heard the word with their ears. But it didn't penetrate any further than the two ears. And so God was provoked by them. And what did God do? Destroy them right away? No. He says, if that's what you want, I'm going to let you roll around in the desert till you die. In this hour, God's going to roll, let you roll around in slumber and sleeping till you die. Now I'm going to go on further in verse 6. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and blows not the trumpet and the people be not warned, why would the watchman not blow the trumpet? It could be on this level. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to disturb you. I want us all to, to agree and, and work together. And if I preach something nice to you all the time, I'll be accepted everywhere. That's not a watchman. That's a tear. But if the watchman sees the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, and if the sword comes and takes a person among them, he that taketh away his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hands. If you out there are calling yourself a watchman, and you don't see what's coming ahead, and don't warn the people, God's going to hold you responsible. Now, in the fivefold ministry, there's headship in it. The main headship is Jesus Christ. Yes, it's in the fivefold ministry where it presents all the different ministry of characteristic of Jesus Christ. But in the earthly part, there will be one main voice. There's not going to be five men that he's going to give them different things, and they're all going to come together and make it... Make it look right. He never done it in the past, period. Why is he going to do it in the five? But somewhere there's going to be a voice. And if, if the watchmen don't take heed, they're going to suffer the same consequences as what's speak about here in Ezekiel. Now, I'm not saying that to... Well, who do you think you are speaking in that manner? If there's someone that's in that office, he's going to have to speak that way. Well, uh, 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 I think the Lord has shown something. And, and if you could all agree, maybe I'll contact yourself, see if, we, if this is going to work out. No, you don't go that way. If the Lord is speaking, then it's to Him that we're obligated to. All right. Verse 8. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his ways, 
Now, there's wicked ways. It's not just the living for Jesus Christ. Those doctrines of the apostle has been restored 54 years ago, 55 years ago. There's been ample warning of what we should be doing. How we should live. How many times it has to be told you? Do we forget that fast from one Sunday to the next, from one year to year? Or what's in the Gospels of the Apostles? And, and what Jesus brought? Because we have to take responsibility for our salvation. The Bible says, work out your salvation. It's not this preacher to work out your salvation. Oh, he preached a nice sermon on how I should live for Jesus. And go home and just forget about it. Well, wait till next time something's preached again. Now maybe he'll correct me a little bit more. You didn't see the picture. The onus is on the individual. Yes, if there's something in the congregation that God sees that needs correction for, whether it's in that area, he'll have his servant to speak things. But if I preach to you the, just, the doctrines of the apostle for 54 more years, which I don't have, it ain't going to get the job done because I'm not a watchman. I'm not watching what's coming down the road. And watching is not just for the enemy, but it's watching for the Lord to come. All right. Uh, maybe, it's, I don't know, it's getting old. I don't know. Maybe because I had that, that wisdom tooth brought out and well, I said, that Brother Fred, I think I know what happened. You lost all your wisdom now. You should speak more softly to the people. That ain't it. Now God says in verse 11, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So God doesn't wish anyone to die. But God will not overstep the bounds of the freedom of choice that man has been given. You have to choose to love and live for the Lord. You are not predestinate to be that in the sense that he made one save and one lost but upon our choices he sees who will and who won't but the wicked turn away from his uh, sorry and the wicked turn away from his ways and live turn ye ye turn ye from your evil ways for why will you die, O house of Israel? O Gentiles, why will you die? Because you do not want the Lord in your life. Only as a convenience. Now in verse 15, And if the wicked res restored the pledge given, give again, sorry, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he has robbed and walk in the statues of life without committing an iniquity, he shall surely live and he shall not die, and vice versa. So in the hour that you and I live, and getting back to the book of Hebrews, chapter Four, uh, sorry, in chapter 15, uh, uh, 3, verse 15, verse, verse 17 now. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not them that had sinned? Was it because they ate too much manna or carousing around? The sin is because they didn't believe what God was telling them. Whose carcass fell in the wilderness. And to whom he swore that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Lest therefore fear, lest a promise being left 
us into entering into his rest, that any of you seems to come short of it. What do you mean come short of it? It's either you got it or you don't. No. It's the promise of the things that God is supposed to put in your life as you lead you along. And if we come so far and then stop, run in circles. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, the others. But the word preached did not profit them. Did the word in this hour preach the brand of movement? No. Why? Not being mixed by faith, not being mixed by revelation. It was mixed with intelligence. They heard the same things. There's many that heard the prophet in that hour. There's many that heard the apostle in, in the hour that, that God was using an apostle on the scene. They didn't have to even be born again to see it from an intellectual point of view. But how do you tell a true seed from a tear? Not when the seed is planted, nor while it's growing, but when it comes to fruition, then it shows it's the head, you ident it can be identified. So as God sows the seed for a generation, let's say those that was under an apostolic ministry, you couldn't tell them apart. Looks like everybody's going to heaven, everybody's listening to the same message. But oh, when God takes him off the scene, and now it comes to the head where it, it has to function, look at the wild revelation that came out of it. But yes, they know just as much of the most of the thing that was preached during those 40 years or 35 years. Less a promise is missing. If we are a, if the ministry that's to be a watchman, they are to watch what God has on ground. God has a word on ground in this hour. Brother Jackson never preached there was going to be three watch. He did identify what time and season meant, but he didn't know when it would, he never preached when it would end, the centuries. And if the movement is leery about that, I'd have to say, you're disqualified as a watchman, because you're just staying with something sure of the past. Why are you staying with something sure of the past? I don't want, maybe I don't want to make a mistake. And most of the congregations are not novice. They've been under a teaching for 35 years. Just to know that there's a miracle war and a building of a temple in Ezekiel 38 39. God has opened up a whole lot more to a true watchman. When the times ended in 1948, I never heard anything to discount it. That there's three watches. But here's the whole thing too. We see Jesus walking in chapter in the book of Revelation now, chapter one. Now in that chapter one, verse thirteen on down to verse sixteen. He's in pictured as being in the midst of it.
But when you go now a little further down, in chapter 2, or a little further, sorry, in chapter 1, he is seen that he had walked already during the church ages. While Jesus is pictured walking in the church ages, he is a high priest. That's in your Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, said he, that hold the seven stars in his right hand, because that's speaking about chapter 1, who walked past tense in the midst of the seven golden candlestick. So from chapter 2 to chapter 3, Jesus is being portrayed as he has already walked through it, through the church ages, that he's high priest. If I got it here. Uh, No, I don't seem to have that one here. Okay, well, that's a matter anyway. But when you see him in Revelation chapter 1, when Jesus walked on earth, he didn't have gray hair, like white as wool. While being high priest, having a resurrected body, which be the same one they will have in the millennium. He's not pictured on that mercy seat having gray hair. Now, there's nothing wrong with gray hair, please. Uh, that's not what I, the picture I'm trying to portray this morning. But when you see in that first chapter, his hair was as white as wool. This is symbolic and having a girdle not around the waist as a high priest now, but around the paps. That does not portray you, Jesus Christ, as being a high priest. That portrays you, Jesus Christ, as being judge. And why is that important in the hour that we're looking at? Maybe I'll go. I must have it in the other directory here. While he walked in the grace age, he's high priest. And if the type is right, and if it's going to be typed as things as we would see, he would be a high priest. Because when he walked during the grace age, that's what he's doing. But when you see him in chapter 1, he's seen as a judge. So what do we see in chapter 1? It's a summary of the grace age. And he's pictured at the end, sorry, at the end of the church age. At the end of the church age, that's when he breaks that seal. And his function to me, it's getting clearer and clearer. Jesus now becomes judge during that half hour silence. He's not high priest. He's not bridegroom. And he's not king. But he is definitely judge. Because that picture you see in Revelation chapter 1 as having the wool hair... 
You can pick it up in Daniel chapter 7 around verse 9. Where the Ancient of Days did sit. He's sitting at that white throne. Judgment. He's a judge there. But he's also a judge here. So if he's going to be judge. What's he, who's he going to judge during that half hour silence? It's the bride of Jesus Christ. And he's not going to judge the bride of Jesus Christ after the rapture. Because when the rapture takes place, what happened at the rapture? Every deceased bride, saint, gets their resurrected body. And they have their crown. The crown is determined prior or at the same time you get your resurrected body. So that tells me that before the rapture actually unfolds, that we go up and the, with the dead in Christ rise first and we alive re, are changed and remain, uh, sorry, are alive to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We have our full measure. You have your resurrected body, and you have your crown of life. What's that crown for? Yes, it's life, eternal life, but it is eternal life with a ruling aspect. So that's why when the rapture does come on, if we have a resident body, our full measure, that's why we're not going to be judged after you have your resurrected body or your crown. The judgment takes place before to prepare for you to, res to be that. And that takes place in that half hour silence. If a watchman is a watchman in this hour, he ought to be seeing this picture. That don't mean they have to preach it. But to discount it. Just like that warning concerning the watchman. If you, heed the, if you hear the trumpet, that trumpet is not looking back in the, in the yard, but it's looking ahead. There's been more reveal. Since 2004. And here's what confuses a lot of them. That they don't want to even dare touch it. Oh yes, we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. That's a true statement. But not all the brides there at that time. Because... I quoted, it was Corinthian last week. It's Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I hope you can, I can make mistake in quoting a scripture, but you know what I'm saying when I'm expressing the, the, the thought of that scripture. Surely you can have enough gumption to go search the Bible to see where, where that scripture is rather than the, the quote of that scripture. So it's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. He's going to judge the quick. And I'd have to say this morning, you that are part of the fivefold ministry, that are watchmen, do you understand what quick means? It's somebody that's been quickened, that is alive on the earth. He's going to judge the quick on the earth. And he's going to judge the dead, the deceased bride that's in glory. That's why he's judge at that time. And he can't be in two places at once. That's why he sends that angel down here. Yes, that angel has more than one function. He cries with a loud voice. 
So the bride will know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you're, that seventh seal is broke. Thunder's going to unfold. But if that's all you know, you're going to be caught short because that angel that's down here is going to be judging the quick. And if you didn't see it coming, unless a promise is left you, then that's a warning this morning. So he's going to judge the quick and the dead. It is that angel is doing it on behalf of Jesus Christ that is in glory, doing it up there, but the angel's doing it down here. Well, praise the Lord. But if I was not a watchman, the Lord would not even bother to show him this. Just love Jesus. Live for him the best you can. Follow the gospels of, of, Jesus, of Jesus Christ and the doctrines of the apostle, and you're going to be fine. I'm here to tell you this morning, you're not going to be fine if you just play there. But not every five members of the fivefold ministry is going to be preaching this, but at least recognizing it. Because if I hold my people with just the doctrines of the apostles and the things Jesus spoke, I have not warned my people. I've only warned you should live right. And if that is what you're seeing as being the warning, that was warning from day one when Peter spoke. That's been all through the grace age. That's not particular here to the end time. It's time to wake up. Is there more to be brought forth? I don't know till God brings things on ground. You don't go home and say, well, I got to stage. Lord, is there something here? Something there? No. He approaches you. And when he does, then he's going to paint a picture. Not everything all at once. But as he starts opening up the picture, it gets to be clearer and more clear as time goes on. What does that say in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1? When is he going to judge the quick and the dead? Is that happening during the grace age all along? No. When it says here, I charge thee before God. Now, when Paul said that, he didn't say, well, Timothy, it would be kind of nice now. If you could, maybe. He says, I charge thee. He's making an emphasis on it. Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. Now, remember, it's to Jesus, the Father, given him the authority to judge all things. It's through Christ. Who shall judge the quick and the dead? At his appearing. And that appearing is not when the shout came. But it should be completed by the time he actually comes for his bride. We meet him in the air. Now, if you have a hard time seeing that, because Paul, the Apostle Paul talks about two events here. Who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. That's when he comes for his bride. She will already be judged because when he gives her her resurrected body and her crown, it is finished. It's been done. And at his kingdom. Oh, my if you don't know at his coming what happened, how are you going to know 
at that opening of the millennium. Who's the quick and the dead there? Now remember, the judgment seat of Christ is for the bride and the bride only. Not your white robes, not the souls under the altar, but for the bride only. But at the beginning of the millennium, who's the quick and who's the dead? And when I, my eyes has fell upon that, I says, well, Lord, I can easily see here during that half hour silence or that seven seal time factor or, half, or that half hour time factor, I can see the quick and the dead there. But who is it that is in his kingdom? It's none other but your white robes are the dead. That's your dead. And it's, the quick is none other but the 144,000 and the woman. They don't die. They're quick. They've been quickened by the Holy Ghost. No, not to the measure you and I have. But he's going to judge the quick, them. As well as the white robes. The yes, they're going to fulfill their part concerning when he, he does come and starts the millennium and divides the sheep from the goats. He's going to bring them in their order and their time. Now, Brother Fred, which one in order? Does he do the 104,000 before the sheep? Hey, I don't know. All I know, he said, it's at his kingdom. It's going to be transpiring in the beginning of that opening somewheres. Like I was told Daniel, wait till you come at your lot. Well, I, hey, I'm going to go on overtime again. No, better not. That's why it was hidden all the time in Luke chapter 19. It talks about when after he had received the authority for the kingdom, he returned to the earth. That's the angel, not Jesus now. On behalf of Jesus. And that angel says, then bring these servants to me. He's not grabbing them out of heaven, but you're in that half hour time frame. And he's grabbing all those servants that's now come into that time period that are alive. And he's going to give them their reward. When he says, you, you, I've given you ten and you increase by ten. That's a judgment. I mean, it doesn't, well, well you're wrong. It doesn't say the word judgment. Well, what do you think it is? Come on now. I don't mean to speak to you that way, but I have to drive the thought across. But the sad part that I see in Luke chapter 19, actually from verse 12 down to verse 15 or 16, it says the Lord comes when he calls, what, ten servants, not the twelve. So that puts you and I right here when that shout started. He delivered some things. Then he wanted to see what people were going to do with it through the uh, prophet ministry, through the apostolic ministry, and in the fivefold ministry. But then, after he says, occupy those things, occupy to look, to be fed. What are those pounds? But verse 14. But his citizens, not the Jews in Israel, but those that sat among the bride listening, hated him. They hated the word that was coming for that hour when he was coming. So there is an element that's going to fulfill that. And what's the outcome? That was not preached before 2004. Yes, the parable had been used, but not to bring it to its time frame that it is there right now on ground as we see it today. 
So in that Luke chapter 19, his citizens hated him and sent a message, we will not have this man to reign over us. It's showing condition what they're doing. They're not saying, well, we don't want Jesus to rule over us. But they don't want the word of God that he brings on ground to rule over them. And so they hate what they're hearing, which in respect hates him that's speaking from heaven. They're not questioning the things of the past. They're questioning of the things that God's bringing on ground. If I was looking for numbers, I wouldn't even touch that. I preach to you love. I'd model myself as what's after what Jerry Olsen is it his name? Yeah, if you want numbers and put out advertisement and uh, you know promotions and I couldn't care less about that than all the goals in the world. But I am concerned what he is showing and what is truth. So brothers and sisters, as it may be, I'll just wrap it up there for this morning. But a watchman in this hour is not a watchman that looks at the past. That's not a watchman. He's looking forward. He has that eagle spirit. He's looking for his Lord coming and he's watching out for the enemy. Two things involved. Happy? And who knows what the Lord may open up in days ahead. I don't know. But there's been a lot of things from since 2004. And the onus is not on the individual that brings it. It's his revelation. If you love me, keep my words, not just of the past, but what comes on ground now. That's what the scriptures really... Well, all right, that's enough. Let's just stand, Heavenly Father, as we look once again, Lord, towards thy face. Lord, I just pray, use the words that were spoken as you would see fit. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. I'll have the musicians to come, and someone has a need, still has a need. I will sing a hymn or so forth. So. In a twinkling of an eye, I've made my reservation for a mansion in the sky. is waiting. Praise God will soon be mine. I've got my motivation to a place called Calvary. By the precious blood of Jesus, the 
vessel He's calling it on board For the destination's heaven Safe from crystal shore We'll be there with the Savior It so happened that Ray and I were talking about so many things that he discussed today in detail. We were just were talking about a whole lot of things. Uh, so many things that he talked about. We t it, that was on our hearts. We had a long time discussing these things. And when uh, we were done, I went into the kitchen. And I believe the Lord gave me this song. It's Bible. Three, Eagle Book. Um, C, I suppose. <laughs> Behold, the bridegroom coming. I hear the midnight cry. Will
Let's all stand. By the things that I see, we don't have overly too long before God starts moving in a miraculous way. And I'm longing to see that day, not just because of the miraculous, but I long to see the gifts operating in the church too. And that's going to involve on every one of us to pray and seek the Lord. We may start out like babes in doing it, but he knows at least we've been taught how to use it and not to go extremes with it. So, praise the Lord. Let's bow our head. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, once again. Lord, I, we would dismiss from this service, Lord, not for thy presence. Lord, we ask, Lord, give us traveling mercy on the highway. We ask this now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You're dismissed.